Good morning. It is the 4th of October, and today we celebrate Harvest Thanksgiving. Lord, open our lips. And our mouths shall proclaim your praise. O God, make speed to save us. O Lord, make haste to help us. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. And together we say the Jubilate. Be joyful in the Lord, all you lands. Serve the Lord with gladness, and come before his presence with a song. Know this, the Lord himself is God. He himself has made us, and we are his. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving. Go into his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and call upon his name. For the Lord is good, his mercy is everlasting, and his faithfulness endures from age to age. Let us pray. Ever-present God, you meet us in the borderlands, in places neither here nor there, at times when we are well out of our comfort zone. Even if we don't know where we're going, when we feel most lost, you were there. You meet each of us where we are, and many of us when we are in need. People marginalized by illness, not wanting to be a burden, those who see their poverty or problems as unacceptable, feeling rejected with faltering self-worth. It was in the borderlands that Jesus met a band of lepers whose livelihood was begging, whose status was untouchable, and he touched their lives with hope. And it was the Samaritan, the one most of all an outsider, who turned back to give thanks. We thank you for all we can learn from our sisters and brothers who live on the edge, in poverty, in the borderlands, about gratitude, about grace and healing hope. Help us to see you in all we encounter and strengthen and enable us to be what you have created us to be, a family, your family, the human family. Amen. The Old Testament reading is taken from Deuteronomy chapter 8, verses 7 to 18. For the Lord your God is bringing you into a good land, a land with flowing streams, with springs, and underground waters welling up in the valleys and the hills, a land of wheat and barley, of vines and fig trees and pomegranates, a land of olive trees and honey, a land where you may eat bread without scarcity, where you will lack nothing, a land whose stones are iron and from whose hills you may mine copper. You shall eat your fill and bless the Lord your God for the good land that he has given you. Take care that you do not forget the Lord your God by failing to keep his commandments, his ordinances, and his statutes, which I am commanding you today. When you have eaten your fill and have built fine houses and live in them, and when your herds and flocks have multiplied and your silver and gold is multiplied, and all that you have is multiplied, then do not exalt yourself, forgetting the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery, who led you through the great and terrible wilderness, an arid wasteland with poisonous snakes and scorpions. He made water flow for you from flintlock and fed you in the wilderness with manna and your ancestors did not know. To humble you and to test you and in the end to do you good. Do not say to yourself, my power and the might of my own hand have gained me this wealth. But remember the Lord your God, 
for it is he who gives you the power to get wealth, so that he may confirm his covenant that he swore to your ancestors, as he is doing today. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And we say the song of thanksgiving. Surely it is God who saves me. I will trust in him and not be afraid. For the Lord is my stronghold and my sure defense, and he will be my savior. Therefore, you shall draw water with rejoicing from the springs of salvation. And on that day you shall say, Give thanks to the Lord and call upon his name. Make his deeds known among the peoples. See that they remember that his name is exalted. Sing the praises of the Lord, for he has done great things, and this is known in all the world. Cry aloud, inhabitants of Zion, ring out your joy, for the Great One in the midst of you is the Holy One of Israel. The second reading is taken from Luke chapter 17, verses 11 to 19. On the way to Jerusalem, Jesus was going through the area between Samaria and Galilee. As he entered the village, ten lepers approached him. Keeping their distance, they called out, saying, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. When he saw them, he said, Go and show yourselves to the priests. And as they went, they were made clean. Then one of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back, praising God with a loud voice. He prostrated himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him. And he was a Samaritan. Then Jesus asked, were not ten made clean? But the other nine, where are they? Was none of them found to return and give praise to God except this foreigner? Then he said to him, Get up and go on your way. Your faith has made you well. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our Gospel reading this morning features a little story of Jesus' interaction with ten men with the terrible disease of leprosy, known to cause severe disformity. Leprosy is a very sad disease. I can tell you that these men were no strangers to social distancing, but social distancing like we cannot begin to imagine. More than six feet and for more than just six months, they were marginalized in their communities for years and maybe decades, treated like outcasts of society. Physical pain and emotional sorrow of isolation were a tragic part of their everyday life. But the gospel story describes Jesus on his way to a certain village somewhere between Samaria and Galilee and the ten lepers call out, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. And then Jesus tells them to go and show themselves to the high priests. My theology books think, link this passage to Leviticus, where it specifies the exact ceremony required to remove ritual defilement. But the bottom line is that they were healed, and Jesus wanted to make it official, sending them to the chief priests for approval. But what a moment for these men healing from leprosy. And after the dust settles, we read that only one of the ten returned to Jesus to say thank you. A Samaritan. He falls at Jesus' feet in gratitude and Jesus says, We're not ten made clean, but the other nine. Where are they? There is so much in this short little story, and there's a few theological directions we could take in approaching this passage. Robert Farrar Capon suggests this could be an illustration of the resurrection of the dead, or perhaps an echo of the prodigal son, or certainly there are the social and political themes of Jesus highlighting the Samaritan's role. But on this Harvest Sunday, as the leaves turn marvelous colors outside, 
And as our world has been turned upside down, I would like to focus this homily on the simple pastoral theme of gratitude. Where are they? Jesus asked this question. It almost feels like a passing comment in Luke's record. Were not ten made clean? Where are they? If I could only see the expression on Jesus' face as he said this, I sincerely doubt that Jesus is trying to give a lesson on proper manners and etiquette, like saying thank you for your dessert or your morning coffee. I know we are Canadians and we like being polite and nice, but Jesus is talking about more than niceties and good manners here. Rather, I think Jesus is talking about the transformative attitude of gratitude that orients our heart towards the Spirit of God. It's a spiritual perspective that informs our life. But seriously, don't Jesus' words here pack a punch? Where are they? I love these words of Jesus. It's a poignant moment with this man with leprosy forever enshrined in Scripture as the one who modeled faith and gratitude. But strangely, like stories in Scripture tend to do, it almost feels like Jesus is speaking directly to me as well, and also to you. Perhaps this morning, that question, where are they? I don't know about you, but if I'm honest, many times in my day and week, I am more in the camp of the nine who did not come to say thank you. But why? Why am I not returning to this place of gratitude more often? Why am I not thanking God more consistently? Why does gratitude get lost in our culture? Why aren't we practicing gratitude like this man in the story? Well, your list is probably the same as my list. I forgot, I'm too busy, I'm too distracted with my phone, the dog ate my homework. These sound like a long list of excuses, but in all seriousness, the bigger reason that my heart is not focused on God is that I'm not always in tune with God's heart. But more distracted by the patterns of this world and the news, the Twitter feeds that come our way that steal our attention and capture us more towards the patterns of this world. Because there's a lot going on right now. Every day is a new story that seems to capture our attention from health to politics to turmoil. I was driving into the city one morning during the pandemic, pandemic and my heart was feeling very heavy. I had the radio on, bad news about COVID-19, fears and anxiety, and it seemed like every story you probably know the newscast I'm talking about and that pit we feel in our stomach with all the uncertainty as we think of our lives, our families, our loved ones, our future, our bank account. And then, almost out of a Hollywood script and completely out of nowhere, the morning sun suddenly shifted from behind a cloud, lifting a curtain across the sky. Joy flooded into my car like sunshine through a window, and the warm sun colored the cornfield in a dazzling gold, and the sky behind the farmer's field was a majestic purple and blue, and would you believe it? A rainbow appeared on top of all of that. It felt like the divinely inspired backstage manager was shifting the scene for me and giving me a set change on this morning that I so badly needed. I reached for the dial of the radio and turned it off. And there, in the silence of that car and this beautiful scene around me, I took a deep breath and I realized this was a holy moment. I prayed a prayer of thanksgiving in that car that day as I looked out on the sublime splendor of creation. I thank God for the glory of nature, for this moment of being alive, and for the peace and faith that I felt so deeply, and my perspective changed. 
Well, that moment was a gift to me. It was like God tapping me on the shoulder and saying, Dale, you got this. Be still and know that I am God. And even during a pandemic, be still and know I am here step by step. Gratitude felt natural in this moment for me. But honestly, so much of the time, gratitude is so much harder, isn't it? And while I'm thankful that for that holy moment I just described, it feels a little like God served that one up on a platter for me. I can't always depend on a divine dramatic backdrop to inspire these moments, almost with an orchestration of strings in the background. Real life is different, isn't it, sometimes? Life is tough. When you haven't seen a loved one for so long, when you worry about your health and safety, when you don't know what tomorrow will bring, suddenly, gratitude is more difficult. I dare say that gratitude actually is a spiritual discipline. It takes something like intentionality and commitment but anything that requires hard work begs a question, why? Why is thanksgiving so important? Why is gratitude so central to scripture? Well, gratitude is the game changer. Gratitude acknowledges the source of all life and goodness and gratitude opens the curtains of eternal sunshine to flood our surroundings with a different story, a transcendent one. It is the ultimate set change. And holding anything up to the light of God brings a different perspective, allowing us to connect ourselves with the story, the bigger story of the narrative of the light of Christ shining in the darkness. A God of love who cares and the reality of the kingdom of God that is present in the here and now, this is the bigger story, a story of hope, peace, and justice. And do we ever need a bigger story right now? And we need the light because there is so much darkness presently. We are celebrating Thanksgiving in a pandemic. A second wave is knocking on the door and we are in being inspired to live by faith right now. But I want to suggest that the heart of gratitude does not gloss over the struggles we face. No, Jesus knew the human heart and the human struggle. He knew sickness and suffering. He knew life wasn't easy. But what Jesus modeled as gratitude was not a hallmark-like greeting, but as an honest, gut-wrenching acknowledgement of trust and faith through struggle, that there, despite the situation we face, there is a bigger story that I choose to align myself with. I choose to align myself with the gospel story we celebrate in the great thanksgiving each week it's the story of death and life and glory and promise and faith and every spot in between. But it is a spiritual discipline, and discipline means dedication. I'm so inspired when I read the gratitude expressed in the Psalms. It's the prayer book of the Bible, a collection of 150 Psalms we usually sing but if I ever want to feel better about my faith, I go to the Psalms because these writers are pouring out their heart to God in every struggle from their enemies to conflict to pestilence to feeling lost, alone, afraid. In fact, there's a whole section of lament songs that follow the same pattern of petition and complaint that they always end in praise. That this is the mysterious pattern of honest spiritual expression as we pour our hearts out to God in honesty, a transformation happens that is unexplainable that redirects ourselves to God, our hearts realigned to the bigger picture from disorientation to orientation as we move through the story arc of each situation we find ourselves in. 
Jesus quoted Psalms many times and reflected in the Gospels and even in the last hours of his life. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? But even in expressing this psalm, I can only imagine Jesus praying the rest of the psalm that turns into praise and reorientation, bringing his heart back into alignment with thanksgiving. This is the story arc as we enter in humans. When we turn our hearts to God, it is struggle, it is disorientation, but it is reorientation and hope as we lift our eyes to the light that shines. This is our eternal hope. And in this hope is our very identity as children of God first. And the realization of the spiritual inheritance we have as children of God and all the richness of blessings that flow from that place of God's family. I don't know if you're feeling oriented or disoriented this morning, if gratitude is easy for you or not, or whether you feel like the other nine, or perhaps you feel more like our hero in the story this morning. But wherever you fit, I invite you to lean into that ancient practice of gratitude as modeled by this dear man with leprosy in our story this morning. I acknowledge his faith this morning and I'm thankful for his life and this interaction with Jesus that was captured by Luke. It's a humbling act to acknowledge God in our weakness, but as we can see, so freeing as we lift our eyes to the bigger story. Gratitude doesn't eliminate our struggles but orients our heart to love and identity as children of God with the good gifts God gives us every perfect gift. It helps us move towards being transformed by the renewing of our minds with a sense of humble submission, releasing us from the patterns of the world. The troubling radio broadcasts, the news, the Twitter feeds to the biggest love possible to the bigger story of the gospel. And as we see with this one man who returned to Jesus, it was action. Gratitude is an acknowledgement in action where we break with one narrative and reorient ourselves to another of faith, his identity, his children of God being lived out in the church. Friends, we are living in difficult times. I know many of us are isolated. Many of us feel scared, wondering what's next. But this morning, acknowledging all that is in your heart and knowing the presence of God here and in this community, I encourage you to lean into faith and gratitude reorient your heart to the Creator through thanksgiving and all the blessings that flow from that identity as children of God. May God bless our hearts with gratitude and the gifts of God's transcending grace as we walk together as a church community through this difficult time. Amen.
now together we affirm our faith in the words of the Shema as we say, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. This is the first and the great commandment. The second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. Generous God, at this harvest time, we thank you for all the good things you give us. We thank you for our food. We remember all those who do not have enough for even one proper meal each day. Lord, bless all those who suffer because of the greed of others. We pray for the homeless and for those who depend on the charity of others. We pray for the work of local food banks and outreach programs providing food for those in need. Help us to share the harvests of the world more fairly so everyone can be fed and there will be no more starvation. Lord of the harvest, hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. At this harvest time, we thank you for the hard work of all those who grow, protect, and prepare our food. For the shopkeepers, the transport delivery drivers, the processors, and the farmers. Bless all those, Lord, who do not earn a fair day's pay for their hard work both at home and in other countries. Help us to want to buy local produce and fairly traded goods wherever we can so everyone can work with dignity and there will be no more poverty. Lord of the harvest, hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. At this harvest time, we thank you for the world we see around us, for the flowers, the trees, and the animals. Bless all those who care for them, Lord. Help us to protect your creation by being careful about how we use your resources so that there will be clean water, clean air, and plenty of wild birds mammals, and insects to maintain the ecological balance of our countryside. Lord of the harvest, hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. We give thanks for all that is good in your creation and all who bring in the harvest of the sea and the land. We are conscious of so much that we get wrong. So we give thanks, too, for your grace and patience with us when we fail to look after your world as we should. Help us to change so that we, too, become a new creation walking in the light of your gospel. Lord of the harvest, hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. At this harvest time, we ask your blessing on our families, friends, and neighbors, and on those who are sick. We pray for those whose lives have been gathered into your presence, whose work here is done. Help us to recognize the interdependence of all life and the importance of just relations and community and help us to become good stewards of all you continue to give us. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. 
Lord of the harvest, hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. Creator of the fruitful earth, you made us stewards of all things. Give us grateful hearts for all your goodness and steadfast wills to use your bounty well. That the whole human family today and in generations to come may with us give thanks for the riches of your creation. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, the Lord. Let us pray in the words that Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. I want to say, uh, just for a moment, uh, a special thank you to our preacher this morning. Father Dale Nichol is one of our honorary assistants at St. George's. And more than that, he is a hospital chaplain and one who directs and coordinates hospital chaplains. Dale, throughout this time of pandemic, you and your colleagues have done extraordinary ministry under the most extraordinary circumstances. And on a day that we talk about Thanksgiving and gratitude, we express our gratitude to you, to your colleagues, to the nurses, the doctors, and all who work with the sick, the suffering, the dying, and the bereaved. God bless you. And now, go into the world showing a gentle attitude toward everyone. Be joyful and be thankful. Fill your mind with those things that are good and deserve praise, things true, noble, right, pure, lovely, and honorable, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you and those whom you love and pray for today tomorrow, and forever. Amen. Oh.